Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Gina Rosam and I'm a member of the alumni relations team at Kellogg. On behalf of the Kellogg School of Management, thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, we wanted to let you know that all attendees will be muted throughout the session. Today's presentation will last about 35 minutes, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. Please submit your questions uh, through the chat, through the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared at a later date. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our host today, Kellogg Alumni Council member, Sarah Burkhorst. Sarah is a 2010 Kellogg graduate from Chicago. She's the executive director of One Goal, a nonprofit organization that identifies, trains, and supports our nation's most effective teachers to lead underperforming high school students to reach their full potential and graduate from college. Sarah, welcome and thank you for hosting. Over to you. Thanks so much, Gina, for that warm welcome. Good evening. I hope you are all safe and well, and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It is such an honor to serve as your host for today's Midwest Region event. For those of you that are not aware, the Kellogg Alumni Council is a leadership group of 47 alumni who serve as ambassadors, provide alumni insights, and help engage fellow alumni in supporting the priorities of the school. Today's event is also brought to you in partnership with Kellogg's Midwest Alumni Clubs. Part of my role as an alumni council member is recognizing alumni volunteers. And I wanna share a special thank you to all of our club leaders for their passion and commitment to Kellogg. And now I am thrilled to introduce to you the Kellogg Clinical Professor of Leadership and also a dear friend of mine, Harry Kramer. Professor Kramer was named the 2008 Kellogg School Professor of the Year and is a proud Kellogg alumnus he is an executive partner with Madison Dearborn Partners, a private equity firm based in Chicago, the former chairman and chief executive officer of Baxter International, and the author of two best-selling books, From Values to Action, The Four Principles of Values-Based Leadership, and Becoming the Best, Build a World-Class Organization Through Values-Based Leadership. Today, he is here to share insights from his latest book, Your 168 finding purpose and satisfaction in a values-based life. Personally, this is such an honor for me. The moment I was given the opportunity to spend some time here with you today, I said yes. I suspected that Harry was a special person when I tried to get into his class as a student, but I didn't have enough points. And then I knew that he was a special person when I had the opportunity to audit his class when my husband went to Kellogg. But I really knew that he was a special person when he showed up to a morning CrossFit class with his lovely wife, Julie, and some other students many years ago. So Professor Kramer, you just live values like no one else I know, and it is my deepest pleasure to turn it over to you. Yeah, th thank you, Sarah. I, I very much appreciate that. Uh, and I, I've let you know, I've just in the last couple of weeks now recovered from that CrossFit, which I think was about five, six years ago. So I, I've just recovered. Uh, but, uh, and you really were one of my best students, I'll, I'll have to say that. So um, it, is, uh, it is my pleasure to be with everyone uh, and, and really to talk a little bit about uh, this, uh, this new book, uh, Year 168. But first of all, I, I really pray that all of you uh, are safe and healthy in this environment, your family, your friends, and, and, and folks around the world. So in, in talking about this briefly, and then I'll, Sarah and I agree that we talk about it briefly and then she'll uh, take as many of your questions uh, as, as, as you'd like to ask. But the thought on this is, and it's great to be also with some former, many former students, that uh, as Sarah knows, when I first started this adventure and, and leaving Baxter, I was fortunate to be able to teach these leadership classes and talk about, well, well how do you become a value-based leader? And that was sort of my, my original thoughts. And then folks said, well, that's how you're a, a value-based leader, Sarah, but, but how do you become a value-based, run a value-based organization, which is really the second book. And about a year ago, I started to get asked by folks, well, okay, that's all great. That, that's all great. But, but how do you live a value-based life? And I thought, okay, well, I'll take a couple of years to do that. But the publisher uh, called me because I, I do all these talks, as Sarah knows, for the One Acre Fund in, in Africa. And they said, well, look, if you can get this done uh, within the next seven or eight months, we'll make another very big contribution to the One Acre Fund. I thought, okay, here we go. And so that was sort of the thought process of 
how do you live a value-based life? And obviously, given everything we're going on in the world now, uh, this becomes more urgent, as you know, Sarah, th th than ever before. And the thought on this is really, and the whole thought process was, what do you do and, and how do you do it? Now, when folks see the book and they say, oh, it's your 168, the first thing that people ask me, well, what, what's 168? Now, if you're not one of my former students, you may not remember, but when you say, well, how hard are you working? Often people will say, well, this week I'm working 24 seven. Now, if you're a math major like me, you'd say, multiply it out, carry the two. You usually get 168 if you do it correctly. And the whole thought process is everybody on this call, every single person gets 168 hours. That's what you get. And thinking about how will I spend that time? What am I going to do? What am I not going to do? Because the one thing I believe is that every single person on this call has at least two or three times the number of things to do than we're ever going to get done. Don't mean to disappoint anybody, you know, on a Thursday. But when you think about your career, your education, your family, maybe your spirituality, your health, a little bit of sleep, uh, maybe a little exercise, CrossFit, we have to talk separately whether that we want to do that, uh, a little bit of fun, and, and to the extent that we realize, uh, as Sarah does with one goal, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're called the short time we're on this earth to make a difference in the world, right? Because we're, we're Kellogg folks, and maybe that's what our responsibility is. We talk about all these issues in the world, who's going to deal with them, and we usually talk about this famous group of people called those guys. There's some famous group of men or women. And reality is we are those guys. If, if we're not the men and women who's going to make a difference, who is? And when you realize how much there is to do, given how conscientious we all are, the usual reaction is well, we'll just go faster and faster. You know, that's all of a sudden where, you know, we multitask. And I tease people with these little devices, right? This helps us go faster and faster. But have we confused, and it's a good one to think about, have we confused activity and product? We're very active. But how productive are we? Are we moving so fast, we have no idea how productive we are. That would take precious time we don't have. Let's keep moving. And I really believe people that are value-based leaders and want to truly live a value-based life, the first thing they need to do is take some time to self-reflect, which for me basically means take a short amount of 68 hours, get off by yourself, turn off all the devices, and ask yourself some pretty serious questions, right? What are my values? What's my purpose? No kidding around. What really matters? What kind of a leader do you want to be? Uh, what kind of example do you want to set for other people? Now, at least for me, I'm not capable of thinking about this stuff, honestly, uh, when I'm doing 10 other things at the same time. But taking a little bit of time to think about this helps me separate out activity and productivity. It actually helps me put things into perspective. It helps me prioritize. Because I start to realize I can't get everything done. No way. But what really matters? What are really the important things? Now, when I mention this to folks, sometimes the reaction of leaders as yourself as well, sounds great, sounds super. The, the problem is, I don't have the time. I don't have the time for it. Well, here's the challenge. Is it we don't have the time or is this something we really don't want to do? Because this, this could be a little sensitive, right? There could be a pretty big difference between what we say is important and what we're actually doing. That, that could be a little too close to home. But we're talking about leadership. Leaders are willing to challenge themselves. Leaders are willing to put themselves out there. And by the way, when we say we don't have the time, well, let's think about that, right? We all commute somewhere, right? Maybe that's a little bit of time. Some of us try to exercise every day. You know, maybe when you're taking a walk, going on the treadmill, the elliptical. Uh, and some people actually pray or meditate, right? So is it we don't have the time or is it something we don't want to do? Now, just to be careful, and Dean Jacobs taught me this a long time ago, um, it's good to define what something is not. So when I say self-reflection, this is not self-absorption. This isn't studying the cosmos. This isn't spending a couple of hours contemplating your navel. No, no, no. This is what are your values? What are you going to do about it? Right? And I think that setup helps an awful lot because it puts everything into perspective. And one of the advantages I mentioned to students and executives when I'm trying to get them to start to think about self-reflection, I'll say one of the biggest advantages, it literally minimizes the surprise. And this may surprise you, but everybody on this call can figure out whether somebody else is being self-reflective by talking to them for about 15 minutes. That's really all it takes. And you say, well, how could that be? Well, it's interesting. People that are self-reflective don't get surprised very often. But people that are not self-reflective are constantly surprised. And you're surprised, they're surprised, right? So I always use the example, I'm out at Hoyer Airport, uh, I meet a former student. Well, you know, Joe, how are you doing? Well, Professor Kramer, no, Harry, Harry, I'm just really surprised. 
Well, Joe, what are you surprised by? Well, I have two young boys now. I have no relationship with my two boys. I'm, I'm just really surprised. Will you spend time with your two boys? No, I don't spend any time with them at all. Oh, then you're surprised, okay? Then I say to myself, I'm surprised you're surprised. Because if you're self-reflective, there's not that many things to be surprised by, okay? Um, you know, everybody on this call at some point in time may not have gotten the job they wanted or the promotion they wanted or somebody they love and care deeply about passes away and dies. It's very unfortunate. It's very sad, but it shouldn't be a surprise. And so that ability to minimize surprise, in my mind, has an enormous benefit. Now, when you're thinking about your life balance and your ability to put things into perspective, the first, time, the first thing that you people usually talk about is this famous line you hear a lot about, and Sarah, we talk about this a lot in class, this whole idea of work-life balance. And every time I hear the expression, I say, let's go really slow, work-life balance. You're either working, or you're living, right? Now, some of us are working enough. If that's not living, that could be a problem. And what I decided early on in doing this writing is that what we really ought to focus on is life balance because most of us are trying to balance our life. Now, in talking to people and saying, well, how do you want to think about your life balance? Very often, people would talk about certain buckets, right? Some people have three important buckets. Some people have 10. Uh, but as you'll see in the, in the writing, usually it turns out to be about six buckets on average for 98, 99% of people. And those buckets in no particular order are one bucket for your career and your education, a bucket for your family, a bucket for your spirituality, uh, a bucket for your health, a bucket for having fun and doing something just crazy, and a bucket for making a difference. Some people call it social responsibility. I actually call it being, being a best citizen. And taking the time to figure out what are you gonna do and what are you not gonna do? And what's very, very interesting is many people truly don't take the time to figure out what am I doing or why am I spending time doing what I'm doing? And I am never going to be the person who's going to judge what it ought to be because, you know, Sarah's 168 will be different than John's, different than Julie's, different than Gina. But in my mind, it's all about do you know where you're spending your time and, and why you're doing what you're doing? And I talk through this whole reflection piece. And then I talk about the fact uh, in the second chapter, uh, you know, why are you surprised? Right? I think you're surprised because you're not taking the time to think about what you're doing, when you're doing it. I'll give you a great example. Uh, one executive came up to me and said, Harry, um, I, I got a real problem. Uh, I have issues with my marriage. I have issues with my children. I, I'd love to talk to you. And I said, well, hey, I don't have any answers. Yeah, I know, but you have five children. You got a lot going on. I just love to talk to you. And I said, all right, well, I'll tell you what, tomorrow's Saturday, drop by, you know, we can sit in the backyard and talk about it. And he said, well, I can't do it Saturday. I, I mean, I'm golfing on Saturday. And I said, okay, hey, Sunday after church, do you want to stop by? Well, I can't do it on Sunday. I'm, I, I'm golfing on Sunday. Now, look, I'm a math guy. If, if, if golf is more important than those things, and that's, he's made that judgment, that's okay, right? Uh, but being kind of a numbers guy, I think it takes five hours to golf. And if you're going to do it twice, I think that's 10 hours, right? Now, if that 10 hours is more important with golf than your children, and you know that, and you're not going to be surprised, fine. But why are people surprised? And so then, Sarah, I tried to think through, okay, it's one thing being surprised. And by the way, when we talk about a life balance and we talk about how you want to do things, it's never perfect, right? None of us will ever be totally balanced. But do you know when you're getting out of balance and are you aware of it enough so that you get back on? And here's sort of the crazy analogy, uh, Sarah, I've, I've been thinking about lately. Uh, if you're in Chicago and you're driving to New York, and with your case, two small children, my case, five, if you're going from Chicago to New York and it could be perfect, you would literally be on Route 80 and you'd be cruising on Route 80 from Chicago to New York. Now, I don't think anybody can do that because you got to get off and get gas, get a burger, somebody's got to go to the bathroom. And so rather than thinking about it as the straight line of life balance, you know, there's a little bit of a sine wave around it. Okay, but I know what I'm doing. I thought about it. I know I can't if I if I have a lunch off at a, at a restaurant for four hours, then I'm going to have a little bit of a problem. But I know it. I know what I'm doing. And then somebody said to me, well, what happens when you're not self reflective? What happens when you don't think about it? And it's what I refer to in the reading of this is when you hit the wall and hitting the wall series, you and I are in that car, we're driving from Chicago to New York. And all of a sudden you remind me, oh, there's a sign that says entering Atlanta. Now, I don't know the last time you looked at a map of the United States, 
But if you're going from Chicago to New York and you see an entering Atlanta sign, you got a real problem, okay? What does that really mean in the real world? We know these people, Sarah. These are people that became a workaholic and didn't want to. These are the people that gained 40 pounds, right? Have a health problem. Uh, they have issues with their family. Now, not knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it, in my mind, creates the biggest problem of all. And when that occurs, you better be surrounded. You better be blessed to have people around you. Maybe it's John. Maybe it's Julie, who somebody can say, hey, wait a minute. You know what? Hey, it was really nice you were promoted. That's really great you were promoted. But are you still going to have the life balance that you said was important, important to us? And the only way that happens, I believe, is that you set up and try to create a certain set of habits right? And these are habits that you thought through, and I go through a lot of examples, Sarah, of what does that really mean? You know, I think they need to be habits that are things that really are doable and are reasonable. The example I sometimes use in class is somebody who's never exercised, they've never run, they've never done anything, and they buy a pair of sneakers and they say, you know what, I'm going to start exercising. Oh, and by the way, there is a, uh, um, there's a, uh, a marathon four months from now. I'm, I'm signing up. Now, let's think about this a minute. You've never run a mile. You've never run a, a, a block, and you're signing up for a marathon. Maybe you should think through, what would small victories look like? How do I get to the point where, you know, maybe I could sometime run a 5K or, or, or a 10K? Are you setting reasonable goals, and are, are you sticking to them, right? Uh, I think somebody gave me a statistic, Sarah, that something like 85% of people that sign up on January the 1st uh, for a health club uh, by the end of February they're, they're canceled and they're out of there. I mean, these were well-intentioned people. But did you carve out the time? And four favorite words, Sarah, four favorite words. Discipline, focus, consistency, credibility, okay? Uh, are you doing this in a way where you're being careful of what's important and what isn't important and actually, actually keeping good track of it? And this whole issue of what are you going to do and what are you not going to do, I always keep coming back to, you've only got 168 hours. That's, that's all you've got. And I'll give you some examples on both sides. Sometimes people will say, well, but my work, you know, I, I just, I can't figure out a way to do less because there's so much to do. And on the work side, I just challenge people to say, all right, how much of what we're doing do we really need to do? Does it have to do something to do with a customer? or somebody you're trying to help, or a supplier, okay? Or is it something we're doing because that's the way we've always done it? I was talking to an executive a number of months ago and he said, I just can't get everything done. And I said, all right, well, let's talk about it. Well, I can't talk now because I don't have the time. Well, what are you doing right now? Well, right now I'm doing a forecast. Well, how often do you do it? Every week, I do it every week. Well, how does it go? Well, I don't have the time. Well, here's a crazy idea. What if you did the forecast once a month and spent a little bit more time on it? Oh, no, I do it every week. No, I know you do it every week now, but what if you did it differently? Well, Harry, you don't understand. I do it every week. The number of things people do because that's the way they've done it is actually remarkable. And I often tell people, you know, there's going to be stuff added. I'm sure you see this at one goal. You know, everybody's got a great idea of something else we're going to do. So if I pretended and said, hey, Sarah, I know she's got her 168. She's organized. She's got it together. And I say, hey, Sarah, could you do this for me too? It's, it's only two hours. Sarah says, okay, Harry, I'll, I'll take that on for you. Now, what I know, what I'm pretty sure of is she doesn't have 170 hours, 168 plus two. She either figures out what she's going to stop doing, or when we get together a week from now, Sarah's going to be surprised, okay? Lots of people are surprised. There's no reason to be surprised, okay? Same thing with something like exercise, right? I'll run into people and they'll say, well, I want to start exercising. Of course, you look at them and you realize maybe that'd be a good idea, okay? Well, you see them three months later. Okay, well, Harry, I haven't had a chance to exercise okay, well, um, what's the problem? Well, Harry, I, you'll understand, Harry, I travel 60% of the time, and by the time I get to the fitness center, you know, at nine o'clock at the hotel, uh, it's closed. And I said, okay, now, if you're looking for an opinion, I have no answers, you're looking for an opinion, uh, I travel at least 60% of the time, but I have a simple rule. I don't go to a hotel that either doesn't have a 24-hour gym, or I don't have an arrangement with a desk clerk, he'll give me the key so I can get in because sometimes I don't get there till 11 or 12 at night. Now, once again, if that's not important to you, that's okay, but don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. And so thinking about things you do that maybe you don't need to do, or maybe you could do less of, but being careful about how you think about that becomes real important. And uh, students very often will say, well, well can you give me, give me some examples? And I'm always sensitive of examples because uh, 
their, in my mind, their opinion. And, you know, everybody's going to do their 168 differently, as I said. But if pushed, they'll say, well, I know, Harry, but five kids, you do these one acre fun talks every week at all these classes. How do you think about this? And I said, well, Julie gets most of the credit in, in this family. Uh, and one of the things that Julie had mentioned, and I may have mentioned this to you one time, Sarah, uh, she said, well, where do we spend a lot of time? And if we're honest, we, we don't really get a lot of benefit out of it. We, we really don't. And of course, she likes to play this guessing thing. So I'm trying to guess. And I said, well, I'm not sure. And she said, well, television. She said, you know what? We said we're going to watch it for an hour. We watch it for three hours. We don't get much out of it. It's not good for the kids. And I immediately was a little defensive saying, wait a minute, I, I, I need to know the news. And she said, well, Harry, you read the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Economist every day. Harry, Harry, the only thing you know by watching the news is, you know, Jojo the giraffe escaped from the zoo. You, you, you've missed nothing by not watching the news. So we made the decision, all right, we're not going to watch television. So the last time I watched television was probably 30 years ago. Now, students, though, some people will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you don't watch television, uh, what about sports? What about sports? So rather than giving an answer, Sarah, I usually answer with a question. It's a simple question. Are you going to exercise? Are you going to watch other people exercise? Now, if you want to watch other people exercise, there's nothing wrong with that. But do you do that two hours a week, four hours a week? Uh, I know people who actually watch this 20 hours a week, right? Now, by definition, they only have 148 hours, right? Now, do you know where you're spending your time and why you're spending your time where you are? And I really do believe that ability to have discipline, focus, consistency, credibility has an enormous impact on, on how you look at this. Now, it goes the other way as well, right? If there's something that's really important to you, are you making sure that no matter what, and one of the items on that side was Julie made the comment early on in our relationship. Hey, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of relationships that don't stay together. And I think it's because, you know, everybody's busy, everybody's running around. Uh, and she made the comment, Harry, maybe what we should do, maybe what we should do uh, is literally decide right up front that one night a week, no matter what, whether we have children or don't have children, no matter what, one night a week, We'll get a babysitter and maybe it's going to dinner. Maybe it's taking a long walk. Maybe it's going to a movie, whatever. But that one night is how we make sure that we really do stay connected, right? That we're not kind of flying off to the point where we don't even know who we all, who one another is. And we've basically done that now. And by the way, she'd say, if, um, if another couple says, Hey, let's do something. Well, not that night, because that's the one night that that's, it's our night. And uh, interestingly enough, I guess it's, uh, I should know, I think it's August the 9th. Uh, is our 40th wedding anniversary, uh, and we've spent one night a week for the last for the last 40 years. And I think, again, having that discipline to say, no matter what, what are we going to do, and 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 what are we not going to do? So, in thinking about that model, right, of of making sure that I limit the surprise, making sure that no matter no matter what I do, that I'm literally thinking about this constantly and always trying to figure out what's going to happen and what not's going to happen. I, I sometimes get ac accused of, well, wait a minute, but this, this sounds, uh, uh, there's no spontaneity. I mean, I, I, I kind of love to do things on the spur of the moment. And that's why one of the chapters, Sarah, I've literally labeled as being planful and have spontaneity. And people say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, uh, am I going to be planful or am I going to have spontaneity? And you remember, may remember from my class, anytime I'd ask a question, if you answer yes, you always get partial credit, right? So it's definitely going to be both. But people say, well, I, I don't know how that would work. Well, here's the reason why it's good to be self-reflective. And it's a little bit of a surprise to people. But it turns out that by being planful, okay, you literally have a lot of degrees of freedom. If you're not planful and everything is at the last minute, you have no flexibility whatsoever. So for example, okay, if some of us remember when we were back in college, you know, you get an assignment that's, that's due in two weeks, some big paper, right? Well, maybe a good idea is do a little bit each night so that by the end, you know, you only have a little bit to do the last night. I mean, I had a roommate in college where we had a 20 page paper. The last night he rolls into our dorm room with like 30 books and a pack of cigarettes and it's like, okay, I got 12 hours. I got to motor through this. The problem with that approach is if I came up to him and said, hey, guess what? I've got some extra tickets to something. Well, there's no way he can be involved in that because at the end of the day, he's got no degrees of freedom, right? He's limited that. And that's why as much as I'm organized and I try to be pretty planful and in my mind and in my notes, I kind of know what I'm doing, you know, pretty much each day for the next 12 months, right? While I've got that laid out, 
all right? I think I'm actually pretty flexible. So uh, no one's taken me up on this yet, Sarah, but uh, if somebody calls me now, maybe it's you, and says, hey, Harry, I know it's at the last minute, but I've got two extra tickets for Bruce Springsteen in Dallas, I'll be there. I mean, I will be there. There's not even a question I'll be there because I'm, I'll plug and play knowing the fact that what you think you're going to do in a plan, you, you may have some flexibility. But making sure that you've got some flexibility, I think, becomes a really, really key part uh, as to, as to how, you, how you look at this. So that process then helps you decide, okay, now let's look at my six buckets. Do I have the right ones? Which are important and, and which aren't? Right? So we literally go through and talk about, okay, this is my career. Now, how balanced do I want to think about my career? Is, it, is this something I really do want to do? Or is this something I'm doing mostly because that's what other people wanted me to do? You know, it's a, it's a little bit, Sarah, I'm sure you've seen this when a, a a Kellogg person will come up to me and say, well, I'm trying to decide. I I'm not sure whether I want to work for this consulting firm or that consulting firm. What do you think, Harry? I said, we can talk about that. But before we talk about that, why do you want to be a consultant? It could be a great career, but why do you want to do that? And are you doing that because that's what you want to do? Or is that because what it seems like everybody else is expecting you to do? Because I, I really do believe a part of this life balance is reaching a point in time where what you really decide to do is what you really believe you're called to do, what's important to you, as opposed to worrying about, well, what are other people going to think? And one of the examples I, I like to use in class when we talk about, boy, I, I wonder what other people think. Uh, I use a simple example of uh, a fellow that I met who was in his 80s a long time ago, and uh, it was very interesting. I said, well, how did you think about your life? And he said, well, when I was about 50, what I really wanted to do is I, I really wanted to teach. That's what I really wanted to do. Um, but I decided I really couldn't do it because I was really, truly worried, what are people going to think? And he said, let me tell you something. When you're 85 and you think about this, it's sort of interesting because he said, Harry, I think it's true for you. And by the way, I think it's true, Sarah, for all of our listeners. He literally said, any person can divide everybody in the world into two groups. And I never thought about this, but I thought it was pretty interesting. He said, if you're really fortunate and you're really blessed, that first group could be as many as 10 people. And he said, and then there's everybody else. Now he said, let's talk about those two groups. The first group of 10 people, you never have to impress these people. You never have to talk about how, how great things are going because when you tell them, uh, Sarah, that uh, I've been promoted, their first comment is, well, Sarah, are you taking care of yourself? You know, are you staying healthy? Are you doing okay? How's John? How's the family? Okay. So these people, you don't, these people just want you to be happy. So worrying about what these people think doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Now you've got everybody else. Well, the interesting thing about everybody else, everybody else is mostly focused on themselves, right? They're, they're not bad people, but they don't have a whole lot of time to worry about what you're doing. They're trying to figure out what they ought to be doing. So this whole idea of maybe I ought to think through in my career and my education, what, what am I called for? What, what do I really want to do? Okay. So I think about that piece. And then when you think about family, again, it's going to be very, very different. You know, some people would say, hey, I can't spend a lot of time with, with my children, if, if you have children. Uh, but you know what? We can spend quality time. We can't spend quantity, right? And of course, Julie jumped on this one right away and said, our children, we have five children. Harry, I don't think our children know how to spell uh, uh, quality. We're either there or we're not there, right? And making sure you're really there, I think, is something you really ought to think about, right? People say, well, what do you mean? No, I'm, I'm attending my, my, my uh, uh, children's events. I'm involved. And a story that I remind of that I always remind other folks is uh, when I was coaching a group, Sarah, of uh, 15 first grade girls in a soccer, uh, and the one girl had, had kicked a goal. And I said, hey, isn't that great? Hey, your dad and mom are there. They're in the stands. And this little girl, she couldn't have been more than six years old, said, well, Mr. Kramer, they're here, but they're, they're just looking at their phones. I don't think they're even watching me at all, right? So where are you spending your time? Have you thought through? Are you really present? And if, if, but now, if that's not important to you, well, then that's okay, right? Um, some people have, have a spiritual component. Some people don't. But what really matters to you, and, and by the way, if that is important, and for some people it, it's not, if it is important, uh, are you spending the time doing that consistent with what you said, you said, or you believe is important, right? I'll run into people uh, that'll say, well, you know, I, I would really love to, uh, to go to church or the, or the synagogue, temple, whatever, but uh, I just don't have the time. And I said, well, let's think about that a minute. You do have 168 hours, okay? And by the way, if you only spend two hours a week on it, that's basically 1% of your time. So you decide, is that important? And, and, maybe, and maybe, quite frankly, it isn't. Um, 
The fourth bucket of health, I think, becomes very interesting because one of the things I think it's true, Sarah, for everybody uh, that's a Kellogg uh, graduate is we're busy people. We got a lot going on. And I always remind people that we're not running, we're not running a sprint. We're running a marathon. And for those of you that have been involved in sports during your life, I always reflect back on what did the coach tell you? You know, hey, you better get some sleep. You better eat right. You better pace yourself. And in reality of life, what ends up happening is, look at what's happening to a lot of us, right? We're running around on airplanes. We're not getting enough sleep. We're eating stuff we shouldn't be eating. There's no way you're going to make it. And this whole idea of we're really running a marathon. And if we're running a marathon, pacing yourself and making sure that you're taking care of yourself, I think becomes very important. Now, some people would say, boy, Kramer's talking about this you know, importance of discipline and consistency. Well, right away, I jump onto the fifth bucket, which is fun. Hey, what? If you're not having fun, what are we doing? And that's going to be different. And some people say, well, I don't know if I've got the time. Well, I guess I would say, if you don't have the time for fun, maybe you need to re-examine your life and figure out what am, I, what am I living for? And if it's something that you really want to do, making sure you really are carving the time out for it. And I use the example where in some cases, this is another balance, in some cases, maybe you can combine a couple things. So on one hand, you know, if you're at your student's uh, or your child's sports event and, you know, you're on your phone, maybe you're not really present. But I explained to one person, you know, when I was a CFO at Baxter and I'd get asked to go to games with some bankers, I'd say, well, you've you got three children, don't you? I'll tell you what, you bring three of your children, I'll bring three of mine, but we'll go to, an, we'll go to some kind of an event, right? They're excited about the event. I'm spending some time with them at the event. And, and we're also getting some, some, uh, some business done at, at the same time. And then some people would say, well, you know what, if, if I'm doing all those things, I'm in pretty good shape. And I said, well, but wait a minute, we're really talking about living a, a value-based life. In that case, then you have to ask yourself the final piece of, well, what am I doing to make a difference in the world, okay? And if I said early on, if we are those guys, if we are the men or women that need to make a difference, what, what are we doing? And very often, because we're busy, and there's a lot going on, and we can easily rationalize, I think there's a view of, oh, that's important, but I'll do that later on in my life. I'll, I'll do that, you know, when I'm 50 or so on. And one of the things, Sarah, I get very excited about uh, of, of, of your guys' generation now is that a lot of you have said, you know what, I'm not waiting till I'm 50. Why would I do that? If this is an important part of my life and making a difference is something that I really want to do, I, I better get it plugged in earlier. And as you know, Sarah, when people say, well, I'll have more time later, I don't think we're going to have more time later, right? There's going to be more things that are going on. There could be children. There could be elderly parents. Uh, there could be other things in your life that become very, very important. But if that's important, carving out the time and making that happen, I think, becomes very, very important. Because at the end of the day, I always look at it as if Kellogg folks are not the people out there that are going to take on these issues, then, then, then who are? And that's exactly why I do all these talks. All the proceeds, as Sarah knows, from all these books and talks all goes to the One Acre Fund. Uh, and if you're not familiar, I, I would put a plug in for Andrew Yoon that I know you are aware of, Sarah. This was a guy who literally said, you know what, I I'm not waiting until I'm 50. And the day after he graduated from Kellogg, he moved to Kenya, all right? Because he basically said, wait a minute, how could it possibly be that a billion people in the world aren't eating and we're kind of somehow comfortable with that? And how could it be that 85% of those people that are out there um, are farmers? I mean, and it was like, wait a minute, simple light up. How does a farmer starve? And if we could get these people better seeds, better fertilizer, basic irrigation, we ought to be able to double or triple the crop yield uh, on these farms. And I would take a look at oneacrefund.org because I, I talk to him quite frequently. And if you haven't looked at this lately, I believe, Sarah, he and his team have doubled or tripled the annual crop yield now on more than 1 million farms that has saved the lives of 4 million children. They started in Kenya. They're now in Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania. They started on Ethiopia. And uh, there's actually a, a TED Talk he's done, Andrew Yoon, Y-O-U-N. And the fascinating part of it is when you talk to Andrew, he'd say, Sarah, we're like 2% of the way. All right, we've just, we've just scratched the surface. And by the way, Harry, I'm not coming back. And I said, well, you know what? You're not coming back. Well, guess what? You know, I've done 1,100 of these talks. I'm going to do another 1,000 another of them for, for, this, uh, for this one acre fund. So this whole idea of how do you think about your life, what really matters, and have you really, truly taken the time to think about this as yourself? And by the way, 
Are you blessed and fortunate enough to have a few people? Maybe it's a significant other. Maybe it's a college friend, somebody you can bounce this off of. Because when I think about self-reflection, let's be honest, it's very easy, very easy to convince yourself of anything, right? As Julie would say, hey, Harry, left to your own, you could convince yourself, you want to know what I think. Now, the answer to that question is always yes, okay? That's always yes. And just getting somebody else who can actually push back at you and say, wait a minute, Harry, you said that's important in your life, but you're not spending any time on it. So that's a little bit of a summary of this, Sarah. I would be more than happy uh, if folks want to. I'll spend another four hours talking about it, but I know that uh, everybody's only got 168 hours. So maybe what we'll do is, uh, is stop here and uh, take any questions. Now, what I didn't warn you, Sarah, that I should have, but as a student, you'll know this, a big part of leadership, Sarah, as you well know, uh, is delegation. So if folks ask, you know, pretty simple, pretty straightforward question, I'll take it on. But if it's more cerebral, thought-provoking, complex, I think I have to delegate it to my former student, uh, Sarah Burkhorst, class of 2010. So with that, Sarah. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's begin with some of those Q&As. I'm seeing a few questions in the Q&A here around just this current moment that we're living in and uh, just the tremendous amount of uncertainty that everyone is, is experiencing right now. So some questions around how you navigate balance and your 168 in this moment. And also some questions around, actually does this pandemic provide some unique opportunities for reflection? So I'll, I'll package those two together for you. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, it's, it's a fantastic question. And, uh, and literally, if we were spending a lot more time, what you're opening up, Sarah, is, is really critical, as you well know. Uh, one of the other advantages I should have mentioned related to self-reflection, which leads us right into a discussion uh, related to the virus, is I always say to folks, and you've probably heard me say this, Sarah, is that there's certain things we all get involved in, Sarah, that we do more than we wish we did, right? That involves worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress, just to name five. Now, what do you know about those things? They're unhealthy. They, they are absolutely things that are a waste of time, not productive, but if you get involved in them, it's a little hard to get out of. And what I realized is if you're a value-based leader, and as we said before, through self-reflection, you minimize the surprise, I think what you can usually do, Sarah, is predict or figure out what am I going to do, not if there's a crisis, but when there's a crisis, right? Because I'm sure you've had the ups and downs at one goal, I'm sure you've had during your life. And so what I realized was, Taking the time through self-reflection, I'll, I'll give you sort of a model and then specific, Sarah. What I decided early on was, wait a minute, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, when there's a crisis, I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do, Sarah, I'm going to try to do the right thing. I'm going to surround myself with people with strong values that I can listen to. I'm not going to figure this out by myself, with, but with a lot of help, number one, we're going to do the right thing. Number two, we're going to do the best we can do. Why? Because that's all we can do. And I'm giving you the short version of this, but here's the deal. If you can convince yourself, if you can convince yourself that no matter what happens, I'll do the right thing, I'll do the best I can do. I would argue worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress can be significantly reduced. You can never eliminate them, right? Welcome to the real world. We're all human. And you could argue bosses we've had would say, hey, Harry, a little bit of stress is not all bad. The problem is we got a lot more than a little bit. And I, and I mean that very sincerely. I would ask each one of you to literally think through when you're self-reflective, okay, what am I going to do when these things happen? And the example that I give, it sounds a little morbid, Sarah, but I say, all right, what, what would be my worst nightmare uh, for tomorrow? I don't, you know, tomorrow's Friday. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I guess the worst for me would be something happens to Julie uh, or something happens to one of the five children. I hope it doesn't happen. I'll pray it doesn't happen. I'll do everything I can to prevent it. But Sarah, if it does happen, I can honestly tell you, I know what I'll do. I'll try to do the right thing. I'll do the best I can do because that's all I can do, right? So now if I take that into what we're currently dealing with now, I think that same model, okay? We have a lot of really terrible things going on, right? We have a half a million people dying. We have almost 30 million people that have lost their job. Okay, so what do we do? What can we do to help these folks? What can we do to try to make, try to make a difference? And I think... Part of this, in my mind, is trying to help people through it, 
trying to help people understand what's happening and why. And another little model, Sarah, that, that I've used that I think becomes very, very helpful, and this now is in the role like you're in running an organization, this whole view of, okay, how do I now deal with this? Communication is a big part of it and a very, very simple model. Part one, you tell people what you know. You don't lie, you don't make excuses, you don't make stuff up, you listen to the experts, but you try, to, you try number one, to tell people what you know. Number two, you tell people what we don't know. We don't know how long this is gonna last. We don't really know uh, what the cure is gonna be. But number three, we get back to people as often as we can with an update on what we didn't know. And what does that do? It shows vulnerability. It shows relatability. It shows, hey, I'm not making stuff up as I go here. And I think that's what you need as a leader. And by the way, when you're in this period, the importance of communication becomes exponential. Thanks so much. Harry, how do you recommend getting started on being more organized with your time if you're just at the beginning of this? One of the yeah. uh, questioners here asks, they say, okay, now that I've noted I only have 168, sort of what do I do next? And um, how structured do you recommend that plan would be? Yeah, and, and actually in, in the book, I try to go through some examples of, of this. The simplest way I think it is, is first sitting down, and maybe it's yourself, Sarah, maybe it's a significant other, and literally thinking through what really is important to me. And it's gonna be different for each person. I'm, I'm incredibly sensitive, it's gonna be very, very different. But, but what do they look like? What is that? And then I start to look at my time and I say, all right, you know, if, I, if, I could, if it could be perfect, what percent of my time would happen on each of those? Okay, that's the first piece. The second part uh, becomes, all right, where am I spending my time? And I recommend, Sarah, to people who take their calendar, walk through the last four or five months and figuring out on average, where did you spend your time? In fact, Sarah, there's a little exercise folks can do, but the warning, big, big warning, do not attempt this exercise unless you're in a really good mood. You wanna, you, Sarah, you wanna be in a really good mood because the first column is the goal for those six, right? The second column is on average where you've spent your time. So the third column, Sarah, is the difference. Now, I've yet to meet the person. In fact, Sarah, it could be you who looks at this and says, now there's an amazing coincidence, okay? My goal lined up with exactly where I'm spending my time, right? Usually there's a difference, all right? And now you have to ask yourself, if there's, if there's a relatively small difference, welcome to the real world. If there's a big difference, then you have to ask yourself, well, Sarah, is there a big difference because um, I said that was important, but it really isn't. Oh, no, no, that's really important, but I don't have my act together to really spend the time on where I should really spend it. So that process, and by the way, Sarah, I always tease folks, the sum, if you think of those six buckets, right, the sum of those six percentages, Sarah, as a, as a rule, cannot exceed 100%. That's just a little rule, okay? Little rule. Uh, and some people say, well, isn't that obvious? Well, no, it's not, Sarah, because maybe you remember this in your career when your boss comes up to you and says, Sarah, Sarah, I need 110% from you. It's like, what are you talking? There's only 100%. That's all there is, 100%. Um, so I, I would say thinking through what's a goal, what really matters to you, where are you spending your time, and just honestly think about what, why is there a difference? And if the difference is big, what are some things I, I could start to fool around with a little bit here that could help me get a little bit closer? And related to that question, what are some ways that we can get our team members to spend more time on self-reflection? How do we help foster that type of environment in our workplace? Yeah, super. Um, so the, the way I first think about this one, Sarah, I always I use the, I think Andrew Carnegie, the steel industrious quote that he said, um, the older I get, the less I listen to what people say, the more I watch what they do, right? So if, if in your organization at one goal, if you want to have an impact, Sarah, the best of all worlds is through your example right? If you're running around like crazy and getting upset and swearing or whatever, well, let's not wonder why it's a, but if you are calm and you are, you know, setting an example and you're in a meeting with me and says, well, Harry, I'll tell you what, but let's just spend the first 10 minutes just thinking about this a little bit. Let's just get a flip chart. Let's slow down. Let's think about it. And you, through your example is always the best way to start, number one. And the second one is, as you well know, Sarah, as a leader, our primary responsibility is to develop people right? So this is where the feedback comes in. So if I roll reverse it that way, and you work for me, whenever you and I are sitting down, hey, Sarah, you know, how, how do you feel about your time? You know, I, I kind of noticed that, you know, you're consistently here at eight o'clock at night. Uh, you know, is that, is, that, is that the right thing you ought to be doing? Do you have the right balance? Are you there just because you feel you need to show people that you're there? Um, and so, th so through a combination of your example, 
And the feedback that you're giving to somebody and demonstrating, hey, I really care a lot about you, Sarah. I, I want to think through what I could do to help you. I think that's the combination. And related to that, how do you ensure that you're holding yourself accountable? Ah, okay. Well, this is perfect because this is where you've got to have other people that you know well enough that they will hold you accountable. So I'll, I'll use you as an example, Sarah. If you and I are working together and I say, boy, here's a great lady. She's got her act together. She's got great values and we're working together. I'm going to take you to lunch. And, uh, I'm going to, we're going to sit down and I'm going to talk a little bit about what matters to me and what, how I'm trying to focus. Um, and then what's perfect is I get your reaction and look at the range of reactions I could get from you. And I'll give it to you, Sarah, from the good to the bad, right? The good is, as I'm explaining this, you stop me and say, Harry, Harry, I've been working with you for a couple of years based on your actions. I could have guessed what your values are. I mean, you are, you're lined up perfectly, right? Now the other one's a little scarier. The other one is when you say, wow, Based on your actions, I'm amazed you're deluded enough to think those are your values. You're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? So you, you have to find somebody who's not going to just tell you what you want to hear, but they're going to be open and sincere enough with you to say, wait a minute, you know, Sarah, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think your actions mirror what you say your values are. That's the way I kind of think about it. And do you have any suggestions for participants on how you can develop discipline? Ah, I have to reflect on that for a moment here. Um, I think it starts, I think all of this starts with self-reflection to the point of, hey, if I'm not very disciplined, let's take a little bit of time to think about that. Why, why is that? Uh, is, am I uncertain whether it's something I really want to do? I mean, for example, if I, if I say I'm going to exercise and I don't, uh, is, is, that, is that a discipline problem or is that something I really don't want to do? And if I really don't want to do it, why, why am I saying I want to do it, right? And so I think that, that ability to step back and be open with, that's why, Sarah, you need some quiet time uh, and you need to reflect on it. And what I try to do, and I mentioned this and all these questions are in, in the book, Sarah, I, I literally try to take 15 minutes at the end of every day and go through a personal self-examination. And at the, in that 15 minutes, I'm not a morning person. Maybe it's five children, a lot of sport, a lot of sports, a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, teaching and everything else, boards. So I'm a, I'm a night guy and I will always spend 15 minutes every night going through a personal self-examination. Uh, mine sort of goes like this, Sarah. Uh, what did I say I was going to do today? What did I actually do? What am I proud of? What am I not proud of? How did I lead people? How did I follow people? If I live today over again, what would I have done differently? And then the last one is if I have tomorrow, being fully well aware that sooner or later I won't, but if I do have tomorrow, based on what I learned today, how will I operate differently tomorrow on whatever dimension of your life has any significance, right? And students will say, well, do you do that every day? I say, no, I, I do it every day. In fact, everybody on, on the call here, if we're at a party till midnight, most people are probably going to brush their teeth because they got in that habit when they were two years old. So this is a habit. I've been doing this for al almost 40 years. And folks say, well, do you have to write it down? I don't think you have to write it down. I write it down because if I don't write it down, uh, am I self-reflecting uh, or am I just daydreaming, particularly if I've had a couple of glasses of wine? I'm, I'm not sure which has happened. Uh, so finding ways to hold yourself accountable and finding people that help you stay accountable, I think is a big part of it. Harry, you talk a little bit about this in the book, but this concept of saying no, and that that's just as important as what you say yes to. Yeah. And so some folks here are asking, how do you say no politely? Yeah, yeah. I'm only smiling, sir, because we all have weaknesses, okay? Uh, and as you probably know me well enough to know, saying no is not easy for me, okay? I, I, don't, I don't like to let anybody down. So when, when, if you ask me, if you ask me to do something, um, I really want to see, is, is there a way to do that? And then I have to ask myself, okay, I've only got 168 hours. Sarah's a pretty fantastic person. Is there a way I could do that? But if I do, what am I going to stop doing? See, I never mind somebody taking something on as long as they realize what are they going to stop doing? And the other way I've decided over time, because like you, Sarah, I get asked to do a lot of things. Uh, if you were to say to me, Harry, Harry, could you do this? I'll say, hey, you know what? I, 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 I can't, but you know what? I'll find three people who may be able to help you. 
Okay. So I'm, I'm always, I'm always trying to think when I'm helping other people and like you, I, I try to reach out. Well then, because I've helped other people, I'm kind of assuming that if I run into a problem, they'll help me with some, something or somebody. And if the answer is almost that, that'll be always the case. So, so if I, if I can't do it because I can't eliminate something else, I'll usually find somebody who can help that person. So helpful. Another comment here asking if you could comment on how your board service, and in particular, anything you learned through Kellogg relating to board service, um, has enhanced the, very, the six categories for you. Sure. Um, boy, a lot, a lot's on this one. Um, let me reflect a little bit. Um, well, what I find uh, on a board is that you've got a limited amount of time You've got a lot of people that are together and you want to be helpful. And literally by, I think, again, being self-reflective of, wait a minute, if I'm on your board, Sarah, what, what am I here to do? And uh, Mr. Graham, who was the long-term chairman of Baxter, used to say, Harry, um, management manages and boards govern. And as soon as management allows boards to govern or a board member thinks they're governing, well, welcome to a problem. So can you be reflective enough to say, okay, uh, Sarah's got a challenge here. Do I know somebody who can help? And for those of you that are on boards or thinking about boards, the way Mr. Graham described it, Sarah, was he said, the perfect board is like a window. And the reason it's a window, the window is open and I'm giving you advice. I'm challenging you. I'm making sure that what we're doing makes sense, but it's not a door. Okay. I, I can't come through the door because I'm not running the organization. You are, you are. And I think by, by on boards, I find a lot of times trying to really help the CEO who thinks that they've got to be doing everything themselves. But you know what? You better delegate. You better think about your life balance. Uh, and by the way, as you well know, Sarah, the primary responsibility of a board, the primary response of a board is feedback to the CEO, to him or her, and CEO succession. And if we've got a CEO who's out of balance and isn't thinking about 168, we better think pretty quickly who's going to replace them because they're not going to be able to sustain that for very long. All right, I'm seeing a couple interesting questions here that might be linked, so I'm going to I'm going to group them together for you. There's a guy named Jay who wants to know what is the source of your impressive energy level, Harry? And then there are a few other people wondering, do you sleep? <laughs> um, so I, I think those might be linked and, and maybe you could just tell us the real story. So yeah, we, Sarah, you know, we, we, we can talk about anything. Okay. Um, so I, I find uh, the balance is everything, right? So a little bit of the self-reflection helps me mentally uh, and I will make sure I get some exercise every day. Uh, as long as I'm exercising every day, um, I don't think I need as much sleep. As soon as, I real, as soon as I'm not exercising for a day or two, I, I realize I need more sleep, right? And of course, this is always kind of fun because sometimes I'll say you know, to Julie, hey, Julie, you know, let's go to the gym. And she'll say, well, well, I, I'm tired. I can't do it today. No, that's why you're tired. Of course, that doesn't always go well. That's not a great, great discussion sometimes. But um, I, I find, I find um, you, you've got you to gotta sleep. That's important. But, but how you organize your 168, and I didn't mention this earlier, Sarah, a lot of it really comes down to flexibility, right? Because I would never, Sarah, and I should do, the Kellogg folks know this, I would never think about this life balance as, oh, it's easy for him to say because, you know, uh, maybe we don't have to get the job done. We got to get the job done. And so I always look at it as the work has to happen, but it has to happen in a way where we, we create flexibility. So, for example, on the way to having five children, you know, Julie would say, hey, if you can't be home till eight at night, you know, don't come home at, eight, you know, don't come home at eight or nine because it's going to be chaos when, when the kids are going to bed. And so I made the decision when I wasn't traveling, Sarah, didn't matter, no matter what job I was in, you know, I would try to get home at six or 630, um, play with the kids, have their teens, help them with their homework, do their prayers, take a walk, whatever. Uh, now, the reality of life is when they, when they went to sleep, and things calm down around 9.30, usually, usually between 10 and 11, uh, you know, maybe 9.30 to 10.30, I go for a jog. And of course, some friends of mine, Sarah, would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, if you're going for a jog at 9.30 or 10 at night, it's going to be hard to go to sleep. 
I'm not going to sleep yet, okay? Uh, and so between, you know, I call it 10.30, midnight or 12.30, you know, that's when often I would do the email, do the voicemails. Of course, I have a little bit of fun because in a global company, 12.30 at night was a fantastic time to call the folks in Europe, right? Because the folks in Europe aren't expecting a call till late in the afternoon. I'm calling them as they're getting to their desk, right? So, um, and then of course, some people would say, but wait a minute, it seems like you're only sleeping like five hours a night or something. Well, I always remind folks, or Julie will remind folks, when, when the children are small, I would always say, oh, you know, I, I think uh, Susie and Andrew need a nap. And she'd say, all right, we'll put them down for it. Well, I'll take a nap with them. Wait, wait a minute. Who's taking a nap here? Is it you or is it them? Okay. And uh, being very lucky, Sarah, I, I'm one of these guys that I'm very, very lucky. Uh, I would say I've never been on an airplane that within five minutes of being on the airplane, I don't go to sleep because I figured this is a great time to go to sleep. I don't drink on airplanes. I don't watch, immediately put the earplugs in and I, and, I, and I go to sleep. So a lot of it comes down to flexibility, right? It comes down to how you match it, how you match it all. Well, we are getting uh, to the end of our time here. So I thought I'd just ask you one last question and then give you space for any other final thoughts. There are some questions in the chat around the three different books that you have um, published. And do they need to be considered or read in any certain order? Um, can you can you start with 168? And also tied to that, is there do you have any recommendations for folks that want to talk to younger adults or children about this type of topic? And is 168 written for them as well? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, so uh, that's an interesting question, Sarah. I would say the order. Um, well, the, the benefit of the order that it's in for like uh, Kellogg grads or whatever is, is maybe helpful in that, in that, you know, how do I, how do I become a value-based leader, you know, from, from values that, how do, what, what do I need to do to be a value-based leader? And as you know, the four principles, then, then I take that to uh, how do I run a value-based organization building off of that. Uh, and then as we start to get into it to say, all right, that's great. How, how do you live a value-based life? I guess the other way to think about it would be, it, before you even think about leadership at all, starting with uh, your, your 168. Um, but but I, I would say becoming the best always would follow from, from, val from values to action. I, I think that would be a, uh, that would be, that'd be a reasonable way to do it. Um, I, I think folks, let me put it this way, the, the year 168, I've been giving a lot of talks, Sarah, uh, to high schools uh, and, and using, using 168. I mean, I, I don't, I don't write in some very sophisticated way. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty down to earth. So a, a lot of high schools are, 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 are starting to use it. Um, and what I've been doing, uh, Sarah is, uh, since, uh, I do all these talks for the one acre fund, um, I do talks for companies and associations. And, uh, basically I just, all I ask people to do is just to buy a bunch of the books for the, uh, for the, for the one acre fund. Uh, but, but the one, the one that I think younger people would best associate with would probably be your 168 for younger people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Professor Kramer, for sharing your expertise, Harry. Um, and we hope that everyone enjoyed today's event. And I also want to remind you that the books are available for purchase online. I've got mine here. Um, and all proceeds go to support the One Acre Fund, which, as Harry mentioned, is an incredible nonprofit carrying out values-based leadership in action across Africa, founded by an incredible Kellogg alum and social entrepreneur, Andrew Yoon. So please go out and grab a copy of the book. On behalf of the Kellogg School of Management and the Kellogg Alumni Council, thank you so much for spending some of your 168 with us this evening. We encourage each of you to stay engaged with the school and the alumni community, recommending uh, Kellogg students, hiring new graduates, or making a gift to support the school. Thank you so much to all of you who have already answered that call. The Midwest has many active alumni clubs and groups hosting virtual programming and offering opportunities to expand your alumni network. I encourage you to discover what is happening in your area. And finally, I ask you to provide feedback on today's event. We always want to keep getting better. So please complete the post event survey that will be emailed to you. That'll be incredibly helpful to the Kellogg Alumni Relations Committee as we continue to build programming. So thank you again for participating today. Be well and take great care.